Do you see her there saying nothing, just getting out of a car, being served a warrant, stepping aside, police doing their job? That's, and she's quiet. Not a word. Anyways, January 30th, 2020, Lori fails to comply with the court order. That court order that was issued on the 25th of January. And she did not appear in front of Madison County authorities. Now, on February 26, 2020, Ian gives his ex-wife a computer. She later finds documents on it outlining Laurie and Chad's beliefs. These include beliefs in zombie-like demonic possession, dark immortal beings working on the Rexburg police force, and spiritual rankings of one's libido. He forgot to mention the end of the world maybe there as well, because the end of the world is supposed to was supposed to happen in July 2020. On February 20th, 2020, finally, Lori Fellow is arrested in Princeville, Hawaii by the Kauai Police Department and charged with two counts of felony desertion of a child as well as misdemeanor charges of resisting and obstructing an officer, solicitation of a crime and contempt, and she is held on a $5 million bond pending extradition to Idaho. Now, let's have a look at the footage of that first appearance of her in front of Judge Kathleen, and I cannot pronounce her last name because it's kind of quite complicated, but let's just say Judge Kathleen. That is her first appearance, and she will hear the amount of her bond pending extradition to an Idaho. Yeah, she's aware of the charges. Okay. And uh, Ms. Vallow, I understand that you have standing next to you, Mr. Hempy and Ms. Primo. For the record, uh, you understand that you have a right to counsel. Yes. And I'm going to ask you to speak up so we can get this all recorded. Yes. Okay. And you understand that you have the right to test the legality of the warrant. Yes. Yes. And you understand that you have a right to apply for a writ of habeas corpus. Yes. And you, you, do you understand what a writ of habeas corpus is? Uh, we, we got that covered, and she, we, we do, so through us, she does. Okay. So basically, you understand that the purpose of the writ of habeas corpus is to test the legality of the governor's warrant and basically the legality of this extradition process. Yes. And um, you, unless you are charged with an offense, that's punishable by death or life imprisonment that you have the right to post a bond. Yes. And you understand that this court cannot hold you in jail for more than 90 days after you have been identified. Yes. And uh, further, do you understand, Ms. Vallow, that, um, as I said, uh, you and your attorneys uh, have the right to test the legality of the arrest um, you understand basically that you have a right to uh, have an extradition hearing. Yes. And you understand that um, you have a right to have this extradition hearing, and this is to determine whether or not you are the person, in fact, that is named in the warrant that has been uh, some, uh, requested by the state of Idaho. Yes. And. At this time, I, uh, let me address uh, either yourself or your attorney. Um, will uh, Ms. Vallow be uh, waiving her right to extradition? Uh, no, Your Honor. She is uh, exercising her right to an extradition hearing. And, and when are you uh, requesting that we have this hearing? Uh, Your Honor, I'm, I'd like to be heard on bail, and that will determine the answer. But the short answer is, if the court keeps bail as it is, we'd like it to be as Monday, as soon as possible. Uh, if the court is going to lower bail, uh, then it can go further out, such okay. that she can actually make it. And so this leads into your Which, request to lower bail? It leads to my request for bail. Your Honor, um, my understanding is this is a warrant from an Idaho court. It's not a governor's warrant. The application from the state says that they uh, intend to seek a governor's, governor's warrant, or they might seek a governor's warrant, I think, but uh, they don't have one yet. This is issued by Judge uh, Eddings. Right. So as such, Hawaii law governs bail, not Idaho law. And that's HRS 832-14. 
and 832-15. So I, I would ask to be heard as to bail because we are sitting here uh, with uh, a couple felonies and misdemeanors and a half a million dollar bail. Um, and the points I want to make, they just follow, they just track the bail statute. But the points I want to make is, first of all, uh, Lori has a residence on Kauai. Her husband lives on Kauai. She remained in Kauai since Mr. DaCosta made contact with the police in January. They've known she was here. Mr. DaCosta has been in touch with them. I have the emails. Um, police knew she was represented by counsel on Kauai since January 30th uh, of this year as well. Um, she made a trip to Maui on vacation, but she left. Uh, she informed Mr. DaCosta, and he remained willing to produce her as soon as the police wanted her. He's been in contact with the police throughout this, again, offering to produce her. Um, instead, you know, she was arrested and media was calling us um, uh, all day. It seems like it was maybe a made-for-media event at taxpayer expense because, again, Mr. DaCosta offered to the police on January 30th, several police, that he would just simply turn her in. Um, she doesn't even have a passport. And, and as to the charges, as the court noted, uh, a couple of things the court noted today that were, were, were I guess, prescient and related. First of all, there's no life in prison or death penalty in this case. So she has a right to bail. And then again, that should be set by this court under this court's bail standards. The last case, I just heard the court affirm a $1,000 bail on a misdemeanor. We've got two misdemeanors here and a couple of felonies. Um, under the Idaho statute, it appears that the maximum penalty for any of those felonies is like 13, 14 years. So they're basically like bees in Hawaii. And typically, I, you know, that would be typically more in the labor of $10,000 bail here or $20,000. And, and again, given um, her residency here, she hasn't fled. They, they didn't even need to arrest her, and Mr. DaCosta has been in touch with them the whole time. We would request that bail be reduced until the hearing uh, to a constitutional amount, an amount, in other words, that will ensure her appearance as opposed to ensuring that she can't make bail, which is the current uh, state of things. So what specific amount are you asking? I'm asking for $10,000. I think that's how the court would we typically see a bail like that in a case like this if it were here. Thank you. Mr. Kohler, your response. Judge, um, the charge, at least one of the charges that Ms. Vallow is facing in Idaho, uh, felony abandonment or non-support of wife or children, is punishable by imprisonment of up to uh, 14 years in prison. And that makes it at least the equivalent of a Class B in Hawaii, which does qualify as a serious crime under HRS 804-3A. We are asking that Ms. Vallow be remanded without bail. She checks every single box under 804-3 um, in that any person charged with criminal offense shall be bailable uh, by sufficient sureties, provided that bail may be denied where the charges for a serious crime, which this is, and one, there is a risk that the person will flee, which certainly is indicated in this case. She has already absconded from the jurisdiction where the underlying crime is alleged to have taken place. Two, there is a serious risk that the person will obstruct or attempt to obstruct justice. Indeed, one of the charges she's facing in Idaho is precisely that she has interfered with an investigation. Three, there is a serious risk that the person poses a danger to any person or the community. Um, certainly, uh, the charges she's facing um, indicate that risk. And there is uh, a serious risk that the person will engage in illegal activity. Uh, Your Honor, she has no ties to this island other than a uh, rented condominium in Princeville. Um, she has apparently resources uh, to travel and uh, leave. And, Your Honor, the state submits that if ever there was a case suitable, you know our office does not request this on a regular basis, that a person be denied bail, this is the case that's appropriate for that. As far as the identification hearing goes, uh, for us to get the necessary documents from Idaho as well as Honolulu and uh, arrange them for the necessary witnesses, we're asking for an ID hearing to be set in the second week of March uh, if that's what we're going to do. 
Your Honor has up to 30 days. Uh, but to get the necessary people here from off island, because everything does need to come from off island, that is going to take some time and coordination. So we're asking for a date after March 5th on that. Okay, Mr. Kohler, uh, a couple of things. Um, let's begin with um, a statement made by Mr. Hempy a few minutes ago. Are you in agreement with his categorization that this is not a governor's warrant uh, matter? No, the governor warrant has not been obtained yet. The governor's warrant is obtained after the person has been brought in and demanded, uh, exercised their right to demand the governor's warrant. The Madison County prosecutors, per my discussions with them, which have been ongoing, they are prepared to immediately seek their governor's warrant and have it domesticated in the state of Hawaii. Okay, very good. Uh, now, um, Mr. Kohler, the, the, I guess the most important question I have is, why would it take uh, three weeks to, to get the, um, the witnesses or other means of identification so that we can go forward with the hearing? Because we need to get um, fingerprints from Idaho sent here. They need to be compared in Honolulu with um, Hawaii fingerprints that are on file from Ms. Vallow. They need to be, the results of that analysis need to be checked by another analyst in Honolulu, and then we need to bring the witnesses over here. Uh, and particularly if Your Honor is inclined to apply uh, we note that the rules of evidence do not apply to identification hearings, but if we are going to have to comply with those rules, then we need to make sure we actually bring the live witnesses here, and that requires coordination with a number of individuals who, and we have been working on that and advised them as soon as we learned this morning that Ms. Vallow intended to con contest her extradition, we began making those arrangements. But we don't want to get in a situation where we're, we commence next week and then we have to continue because somebody was unavailable, Judge. We want to be able to get it all done at once. And we think, we think that's reasonable in light of the circumstances. Hey, Mr. Hempe, your response? Um, Your Honor, I, didn't, I don't think I heard anything that goes that takes three weeks. And we're concerned with her in custody, by the way, for another reason. Yesterday when she was arrested uh, and we, my office was calling cell block, Mr. DaCosta was calling cell block, and they told him he, she's not here and basically she was MIA for hours and we learned since that the Idaho police were questioning her while the Kauai, at the, with the Kauai police while they knew she was represented by counsel. Um, um, it's just another reason to get this done faster. I mean fingerprints and fingerprint comparisons don't take very long um, and, and getting people over here shouldn't take three weeks. Um, and, and, and just in response to the bail arguments, she is presumed innocent, and I don't think the state has checked the box of danger to the, to the community. They've, they're alleging simultaneously that she's not with the child, the children, but that she's a harm to them, and there's certainly no allegation that she's a harm to the community on Kauai. Um, so that's my response. Okay. All right. Uh, anything further? Either side? Unless Your Honor has particular questions. Uh, no, I don't. Okay. All right. Then, uh, first of all, as to bail, uh, bail is confirmed in the amount of $5 million. As to the hearing, we will set the hearing. Uh, let me just confirm that. Um, We're going to set it for Monday, March 2nd, 2020. It'll be on the 9 o'clock calendar following our regular um, criminal calendar. May be heard briefly? Yes. Um, I know that Mr. Hempe represented that Ms. Vallow does not have a passport, but could we make it um, a condition that if she does manage to post bail, that if she has one, and we will independently investigate that, if she does have one, that it be a condition of the bail that she turned that in. Okay, you want that uh, surrendered to your office? Uh, to the Kauai Police Department. Okay, and any response to that? She doesn't have a passport, so. Okay, all right, then let me just uh, make it clear on the record, Ms. Vallow, uh, should you bail out, uh, you are to surrender immediately upon bailing out uh, any passports that you may have, and that goes over to the Kauai Police Department for safekeeping, okay? All right, anything further? Thank you. No, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Now, with that, court is adjourned. Thank you. Let's go. She was stunned of that five million dollars. She was so stunned you could see her whisper or I mean like you could see her lips move and mention the five million dollars to her lawyer. She's worried about the five million dollars. And then you see Chad Daybell sitting there behind her with his schmirk. Anyways guys, 
I want you I want I want to tell you something as well. Do you see the difference between Chet Daybell how he is dressing up now when he's with Laurie and before Laurie? More trendy, you know, he had a kind of like a makeover, he looks more he looks younger, whatever. You know, and I want to tell you something. So when Laurie and Chet Daybell got married, okay, they they felt that they had to marry. And Chet Daybell told her that they have been married in previous lives. Now, and they had to marry now again, okay? They marry, and Chet married her and did everything at all costs, even murdering his first wife, Tammy, to be able to marry with Laurie Fellow. And for people who have been in a relationship with a covert narcissist, know how obsessed their partner was with their beauty and makeup you know their appearance and everything and they 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 most likely find a very pretty or a beautiful girl you know the more than the average beautiful beauty pretty girl and they will see that one as a jackpot the victim of a nurse of a covert narcissist most likely will will have a girlfriend who looks prettier than the most average girl so they will see that girl as a jackpot and you you see chat also changing very quickly very drastically Okay, he will do everything in his power to marry Laurie Fellow at all cost. You know, told each other that they're soulmates and that they have this soulmate connection. They have married. They married before in a previous life. Blah, 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 blah. That's part of the love bombing phase. And that's a, that's a tactic. Narcissists love to use love bombing, especially in the first period of meeting up. They rush you into a relationship. They suck you into a relationship. I don't know if Chad Daybell is a narcissist, if he's an overt narcissist, covert narcissist, or or, may, or he's just a flying monkey or whatever he is. I don't know, but, but Laurie Fellow is a super narcissist. I can tell you that. I can smell her. Now, a day after that first court appearance, on the 21st of February 2020, Laurie appears before a judge in Kauai again and declares her intention to fight the extradition order. The judge denies her lawyer's request to lower bail. On February 26, 2020, Laurie waves her challenge to Idaho's extradition request. The judge instructs the prosecuting attorney to have Idaho authorities return Laurie to Madison County as soon as possible. Laurie's decision to waive comes immediately after her second request to lower her $5 million bill is denied. On February 29th, 2020, Chad returns to Rexburg area and the home he formerly lived in with Tammy. On March 4th, 2020, Rexburg law enforcement take Laurie into their custody and extradite her out of Hawaii. On March 5th, 2020, Lori arrives at the Rexburg Airport and is escorted to the Madison County Jail. Now on March 6th, 2020, Lori appears in Madison County Court for the first time. Judge Farron Adams reads Lori her charges and sets the preliminary hearing for March 18th and March 19th. Eddins agrees to lower Lori's $5 million bond to $1 million at her attorney's request. Now, let's look at the footage of that first appearance in front of Judge Farron Eddins in Madison County. And you will see Lori Vello's first son, Colby Ryan. You will see um, Kay and Larry Woodcock sitting in the audience as well and you will see Chet Daybell. Now when you see Laurie Fellow walking into the courtroom she is avoiding all eye contact to um, Larry and Kay Woodcock and even to her son Colby Ryan and she looks back into the court to see if she can see Chet Daybell. You see her laughing here and there, uh, uh, but this is actually kind of a very uncomfortable body language she's showing because she doesn't know how to behave. She's trying to laugh, you know, and a lot of narcissistic people, a lot of covert narcissistic people, when they are, when they are put into a spotlight, they often laugh and giggle. Uh, and you will hear me yeah, because it's because I feel uncomfortable. That is what what they would say. And she, you will see her. She she's very uncomfortable. 
She's very un uncomfortable there um, throughout the whole course. And also when she has to leave the courtroom, you will see her leaving without making any eye contact to the audience or at least not to Larry and Kay Woodcock to her son Colby Ryan. She looks kind of to Chad Daybell through the proceedings, but not to Larry and Kay Woodcock because she's guilty. She feels guilty. She knows she's guilty, okay, but she doesn't feel guilty because she says that they were zombies. So she, this is narcissistic behavior. She tells that, oh, well, she didn't tell yet. She didn't say it yet, but she killed her children and justifies it by saying that they were zombies. You know, that is the reason. That is the reason why she done it. So in the future, if she would add, she would mention it's because they are zombies. So I had to kill them. So she just, she's not going to say, I killed them because I need to, I need to get rid of them because I don't want to take care of them. I hate my children. That's not what a narcissist is going to, that's not what a narcissist is going to say. Okay. Narcissist will twist it and justify their actions. Okay. And especially this super narcissist. Before we get started, uh, I'm going to review one thing for the audience here today uh, regarding disruptive behavior. Any activity or behavior which is considered disruptive by the court will result in removal from the courtroom. Any spectator who creates a visual or auditory disturbance of the court proceedings may be removed from the courtroom and or the building at any time at the discretion of me or court security. We'll now call the case Madison County Magistrate Division of the District Court CR 3320-302 State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. Counsel for Ms. Vallow appears at the defense table. We have uh, Ms. Elcox, Mr. Webb and Mr. Means. Uh, counsel for the state is Mr. Wood and Mr. Rammel. This is the date and time set for an initial appearance. The defendant is also present here in the courtroom. Counsel for defense, um, in the court pleadings, it designates Ms. Vallow, AKA Ms. Daybell. How would your client like to be referred to by the court? Mrs. Daybell, please, Your Honor. Ms. Daybell, do you read, speak, and understand the English language? Yes. Ms. Daybell, did you fill out a notification of rights form with your counsel prior to the hearing here today? Yes. Do you understand your legal rights here today? Yes. Do you have any questions about the form that you filled out or your rights? No. All right, we'll proceed forward then. Ms. Daybell, it's my understanding that you've hired these three attorneys that are with you here today and that's your position that you'd like to retain your own private counsel, is that correct? Yes. Did you get a copy of the criminal complaint as well as the arrest warrant that has been issued in this matter? Yes. Ms. Daybell, I can read the, uh, the criminal complaint in its entirety or we can summarize it going through each of the charges. Which would you prefer? We will waive a formal reading, Your Honor. We'll just go through the counts then, one by one, as well as the penalties. Uh, this criminal complaint was filed here in Madison County on February 18th, 2020. Uh, it is State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow, AKA Lori Noreen Daybell. It charges the defendant with five different counts. The first count is desertion and non-support of children or spouse. That count is a felony under Idaho law Idaho Code 18-401, Section 1. The punishment is up to a four-year maximum imprisonment in the state penitentiary 
and or up to a $500 fine. It designates or alleges that the defendant, Lori Noreen Vallow, AKA Lori Noreen Daybell, on or between the 23rd of September, 2019 and the 18th day of February, 2020, in the county of Madison, state of Idaho, did desert a child under the age of 18 to wit, JV, date of birth, 52512, who was dependent upon the defendant for care, education, or support with the intent to abandon JV. Ms. Daybell, do you understand what count one alleges as well as the maximum penalties? Yes. Under count two, it is that same charge, desertion and non-support of children or spouse. It's also a felony under Idaho Code 18401, subsection one. It is punishable by up to 14 years in the state penitentiary and up to, and or up to a $500 fine. It alleges that the defendant, Lori Noreen Vallow, AKA Lori Noreen Daybell, on or between the 8th day of September, 2019, and the 18th day of February, 2020, in the county of Madison, state of Idaho, did desert a child under the age of 18, to wit, TR, with a date of birth of 9-24-2002, who was dependent on the defendant for care, education, or support with the intent to abandon TR. Ms. Daybell, do you understand what's been charged in count two as well as the maximum penalties? Yes. Ms. Daybell, count three is a misdemeanor under Idaho law. It's the charge of resisting and or obstructing an officer, a violation of Idaho code 18-705. It's punishable by up to one year in the county jail and up to a $1,000 fine. It alleges that the defendant, Lori Noreen Vallow, AKA Lori Noreen Daybell, on or about the 26th day of November, 2019 in the county of Madison, state of Idaho, did willfully delay and or obstruct a public officer to wit, Lieutenant Ron Ball of the Rexburg Police Department in the discharge of his office by giving false information regarding the whereabouts of a child, JV, date of birth 525, 2012, and thereby delaying the search for JV. Ms. Daybell, do you understand the charge in count three as well as the maximum penalties? Yes, I understand, sir. Count four is also a misdemeanor. It's a charge of solicitation. It carries with it up to six months in the county jail and a $1,000, or excuse me, a $500 fine. It's a violation of Idaho Code 18-2001. It alleges that the defendant, Lori Noreen Vallow, AKA Lori Noreen Daybell, on or about the 26th day of November 2019 in the County of Madison, State of Idaho, with the purpose of promoting or facilitating the commission of a crime encouraged and or requested Melanie Gibb to engage in conduct which would constitute the crime of resisting and or obstructing an officer. By requesting and or encouraging Melanie Gibb to give false information to law enforcement regarding the whereabouts of a child, JV, date of birth 5-25-2012. Ms. Daybell, do you understand the charge of count four as well as the maximum penalty? Yes. The last count is count five. It's a misdemeanor under Idaho law. It's a charge of contempt, a violation of Idaho code 18-1801, subsection four. It's punishable by up to six months in the county jail and up to a $1,000 fine. It alleges that the defendant, Lori Noreen Vallow, AKA Lori Noreen Daybell, on or about the 30th day of January, 2020, in the county of Madison, state of Idaho, did willfully disobey a lawful court order. In Madison County, case number CV 3320-45, by failing to physically produce minor children, JV and TR, to the Rexburg Police Department, and or Idaho Department of Health and Welfare within five days of service of the order. Ms. Daybell, do you understand what's been alleged in count five as well as the maximum penalty? I understand. Ms. Daybell, do you understand that all of those charges and their maximum penalties could run consecutively one after the other or they could run concurrently, meaning at the same time? Do you understand that? In addition to the rights form that you've already filled out, pursuant to Idaho Criminal Rule 5, I'm also going to give you the following rights. 
Number one, uh, you are not required to make a statement and that any statement made by you today can be used against you in court. Number two, you're entitled to know the nature of the charges that have been brought against you, which we've already gone through. Number three, you uh, are entitled to bail. You have a right to bail. Number four, you have the right to be uh, represented by counsel. Number five, uh, you have a right to a preliminary hearing. Uh, that preliminary hearing must be set within 14 days if you're incarcerated. It can be set within 21 days if you're not incarcerated. That preliminary hearing is a probable cause hearing where the state will have the burden of showing probable cause that the two felonies have been committed um, in order for you to be bound over to the district court. You also have the right to communicate with counsel and immediate family uh, and that, that reasonable means will be provided for you to do so. Do you understand those legal rights, Ms. Daybell? All right, Ms. Daybell, uh, now we'll schedule the preliminary hearing. Uh, I've met with counsel in chambers prior to coming out here, and there's a few dates that I believe did work. Uh, Mr. Wood, on behalf of the state, uh, you designated that the state needs approximately two weeks to be ready. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. And you also designated that the state needed two days uh, for the preliminary hearing to take place. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, does the defense want to comment as far as uh, how much time they need to, to uh, be ready as well as how much time the preliminary hearing will take? Your Honor, I think um, two weeks is more than sufficient and I agree with the proposed two-day setting. Okay. All right. The court has available March 18th and 19th. Does that work for counsel for the defense? Your Honor, the state may have an issue getting one of our witnesses over here from Hawaii um, on the 18th. Uh, we had asked previously that it be set for the 19th and 20th and we continue that request. Mr. Wood, if we uh, made some arrangements so that if your witness could only be here by the 19th, that we allowed that witness to, to testify on the 19th, would that appease your concern? Yes, Your Honor. Does the defense have any objection to that, to moving things around a little bit so that that witness can testify on the 19th and not on the 18th? No, Your Honor. All right. We'll schedule then the preliminary hearing for March 18th and 19th here at the Madison County Courthouse. We'll schedule that right at 9 a.m. Uh, the court notes that there was a motion for a bond reduction uh, that was filed by the defense in this matter approximately two days ago. Has the prosecution received a copy of that motion to reduce bond? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Wood, is the prosecution objecting to that being heard here today? No, you're not. No, we're not, Your Honor. All right. We'll hear the motion to reduce bond then today. Uh, Ms. Elcox, are you going to be arguing that? Yes, Your Honor. You may proceed with your argument. I want you to know that I have reviewed your motion. I've also reviewed uh, Title 19, Chapter 29, and Idaho Rule, Criminal Rule 46. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, we are asking that the court today set bail in the amount of $10,000 consistent with what Lori's attorney in Hawaii requested. Um, in the event that the court is not inclined to set bond in the amount of $10,000, we are asking that the court consider setting a bond no higher than $50,000 in this case. Lori is presumed innocent as she stands before the court today. The fact that she is presumed innocent is not a loose guideline. It's a foundational principle of the American criminal justice system. Bail must be set in an amount that assures Lori's appearance in court and is commensurate with the charges that she is actually facing today in court. A $5 million bond is unreasonable, it's astronomically excessive, and is the functional equivalent of holding Lori without bond. In the five counts the court read today, charged in the criminal case, there is not one allegation of a crime of violence. A bond set this high denies Lori due process and fundamentally deprives her of her ability to meaningfully participate in the defense of these allegations she faces. It is clear that the government just needed to find a charge that would fit in this case because of all of the media attention surrounding this matter. The last thing that should happen is to allow this case to be tried in the media 
and to allow public opinion and rampant speculation to dictate how this case proceeds through the judicial system. Considering the purpose of, purpose of bail to which Lori is entitled as a matter of right, Idaho Criminal Rule 46, as Your Honor referenced, lists the factors that the court should consider when determining the appropriate bail amount to set in this case. Pursuant to those factors, Lori's bond should simply be reduced in the amount requested because she has no criminal history whatsoever. In fact, Lori took the initiative while she was in Hawaii to contact law enforcement and say in the event that a warrant issues, she will voluntarily turn herself in. Police did not afford her that opportunity to do, to do so. They created a spectacle out of the situation when they knew that Lori had contacted law enforcement and indicated that she would turn herself in. She waived extradition in this case. She did not fight returning to Idaho. She has hired three criminal defense attorneys from two different law firms, and she is dedicated to vigorously defending against these allegations. Furthermore, Lori's history demonstrates that she has a consistency in her residence. She lived in Austin, Texas for almost 20 years, worked at the same salon for 15 years. She then moved to Chandler, Arizona, where she resided for five years in the same house. She worked as the director for Broadway Kids, an organization that puts on summer camps for children, and she also taught group fitness. Between 2014 and 2018, she lived in Kauai until she returned there this fall. Lori's history demonstrates that she has consistent long-term residence and a long-term employment in those places that she's lived. She poses no flight risk whatsoever. She is intent on defending against these allegations and proving that she is innocent, despite the fact it's the state's burden to prove her guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. For those reasons, Your Honor, we would ask that you grant the defendant's request to reduce bond. Ms. Elcox, just so I'm clear, uh, if your client were to, to bond out, I, I don't need her address, but where would be her expected place of residence be? She'll be residing locally, Your Honor. I can provide that address to the court under seal if the court would like to do so, but given the uh, media attention, I would rather not put that on the record. I understand. Thank you. Mr. Wood, do you wish to be heard? Yes, Your Honor. I'll address counsel's uh, comments first um, on how we got here and, and why the bond or the bill was set at what it's at. Um, this case didn't start as a criminal case, Your Honor. It started as a report of two missing children who were still missing. Um, November 25th, Rexburg Police, late in the day, get notice that this young child is missing. Within 24 hours, they respond. Uh, when they respond, they're given verifiably false information by the defendant. And so the next, uh, so the next day they obtain warrants and at that, to, to search the residence for the child. And at that point, uh, the defendant is gone. Now they say it's a planned move. Maybe they did plan to move to Hawaii. However, they clearly left very quickly as soon as they were contacted by law enforcement. The vast majority of their belongings were still in that apartment. And so uh, the investigation continued. A Child Protection Act was filed. And an order was given for Lori to produce the children, for the defendant to produce the children, which she did not do. Uh, I'll address this issue that she, she informed law enforcement that she would turn herself in. It's kind of hard to trust someone to turn themselves in on a warrant when a simple welfare check caused that person to leave. Uh, Your Honor, as counsel stated, uh, Idaho Criminal Rule 46 lists the factors to be considered at setting bail. So we'll, we'll go th down through those. Uh, the defendant's employment status and history, uh, as far as we're aware, she's not presently employed. No argument can be made that she's at a risk of losing employment. Their financial condition, we are aware that the defendant's new husband received a substantial sum of life insurance proceeds from the death of his wife last October. Obviously, those funds provide them with the ability to relocate quickly and to stay away from Idaho, which we believe they've already done. Uh, the nature and extent of the defendant's family relationships. 
Uh, the defendant's only family here is her new husband. Uh, and it's important for the court to consider that at a bail reduction hearing in Hawaii, very recently, the defendant's attorney represented to the court that her husband lived in Hawaii, not in Idaho. Now we understand that the defendant does have a house here, uh, close to here. However, the fact that, he re that, the, that the defendant represented to a Hawaii court that they lived in Hawaii shows that they consider their ties not in Idaho, but in Hawaii. And in terms of her past residences, uh, if we go back to the last, uh, the last year, it gets a little more concerning. Uh, in regards, uh, since this last summer, the defendant has lived in Arizona, Idaho, and Hawaii. And quite frankly, the circumstances under, under, the circumstances under which she left Arizona, which was soon after the killing of her estranged husband by her brother, and the circumstances in which she left Idaho, which was the same night Rexburg police did a welfare check on her, give the state serious concern that she is a flight risk. Uh, factor four is the defendant's character and reputation. Since this last summer, there has been a clear and alarming pattern in the defendant's life. There are literally three active investigations of suspicious deaths that she is related to. And I want to be clear, Your Honor, we're not saying she's been charged in those. And we're not saying the court should treat her as such. However, she is related to each of those deaths, and it is alarming to the state. As we've said before, Your Honor, the defendant, has, the defendant tried to mislead Rexburg law enforcement about the whereabouts of her children. In furtherance of that, she tried to convince a family friend to tell the Rexburg police that the children were with her in Arizona, even though they weren't. And that, Your Honor, the defendant has a history of defying court orders. In the child protection case associated with this case, she refused to produce her children as ordered. In a 2009 child custody case in Travis County, Texas, the defendant was found guilty of seven different counts of civil contempt. Factor five, the persons who agreed to assist the defendant in attending the court at the proper time. Again, Your Honor, uh, that's pretty much limited to her new husband. And um, due to the fact that he and the defendant left so abruptly before, we don't uh, have a lot of assurance from that. Factor six, the nature of the current car charge and any mitigating or aggravating factors that may bear on the likelihood of conviction and the possible penalty. In regard to those factors, Your Honor, the state would first point out the language of Idaho Code 18401, which states that it is a felony for anyone having a child under the age of 18 years dependent upon him or her for care, education, or support who deserts such child in any manner whatever with intent to abandon it is a felony. In any manner whatever. Those children ended up being reported as missing and the defendant left the state without them. The defendant defied a court order to produce those children. One of those minor children is only seven years old and has special needs which require medication and medical attention. Both of the minor children received social security benefits and the defendant continued collecting the children's social security benefits into her own account, uh, both after the last known sightings of the children in Madison County and continuing into Hawaii. And it's important to note that, note that case law related to the desertion of a minor child and Idaho Code 19302 make it clear that this court has jurisdiction over acts of desertion both in here in Madison County and continuing into, into Hawaii. And the most aggravating factor, Your Honor, uh, one that's quite frankly heartbreaking and is the reason why there's so much media attention, is that the children are still missing. And the defendant has not only misled law enforcement in their efforts to find the children, but she has completely and utterly refused to aid in any attempts to find the children even before charges were filed. As far as the defendant's prior criminal record, Your Honor, uh, as we aren't aware of any criminal history. However, as we discussed earlier, she does have a history of defying court orders. Um, any factor number eight, any facts indicating the possibility of violations of law if the defendant is released without restrictions. And Your Honor, we would just say past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. Uh, she's already disobeyed this court's order. Um, and so we have no reason to believe that if she were released that she wouldn't continue an unlawful behavior. Factor nine, any other facts tending to indicate that the defendant has strong ties to the community and is not likely to flee the jurisdiction. At this point, Your Honor, with her two children missing, the defendant's only local tie is her husband, who again, as of a couple of weeks ago, claimed that she claimed that he lived in Hawaii. Um, factor 10, what reasonable restrictions, conditions, and prohibitions should be placed on the defendant's activities, movements, associations, associations and residences? 
Your Honor, should be, the bail be lowered or should the defendant be able to make bail, we would ask for the following restrictions. That she be limited to living in Madison or Fremont County, Idaho. That she be required to wear some sort of GPS location device and we're aware that uh, those can be obtained from a bondsman. Um, and that the, that the defendant, if she does have a passport, that she surrender it to the court. In conclusion, Your Honor, the defendant has established through her own behavior that she cannot be trusted to obey a court order or to appear at future court hearings. The state believes that Bell should be confirmed where it is. We have no confidence that the defendant will stay in the area and appear for future hearings should she be released. Thank you, Mr. Wood. The prosecutor has gone through a litany of allegations for which she is not facing any sort of criminal charges whatsoever and not criminal charges in this case. Those should not be considered by the court for purposes of this case and setting bond pursuant to Idaho, uh, the factors listed in Idaho Criminal Rule 46. We would ask that you, you grant um, the defendant's request and set bail as requested in this matter. Thank you, Ms. Alcox. The court has listened carefully to the argument of both the state and the defense. The court has reviewed in detail and in full Rule 46 of the Idaho Criminal Rules. The court has also uh, reviewed the Idaho Bail Act, Title 19, Chapter 29, specifically under 192904. It designates that the court may release a person on his own recognizance or set an amount of bail and may impose any conditions of release. In making these determinations, the court shall consider the following objectives. Number one, ensuring the appearance of the defendant. Number two, ensuring the integrity of the court process, including the right of the defendant to bail as constitutionally provided. Number three, ensuring the protection of victims and witnesses. And number four, ensuring public safety. The court has taken all four of those factors into consideration as well as all 10 factors in, under subsection C under the Idaho Criminal Rules 46. And based upon the argument that I've heard here today, the court is going to reduce bail. Uh, I'm going to reduce bail to the amount of $1 million. I recognize all of the factors that have been looked at here. One specific thing that uh, the court notes in setting such a high uh, bail amount is that there is a pending court order. And to my knowledge, there has been nothing set forth uh, regarding uh, obedience to that court order. Uh, pertaining to uh, lining the court out with information on where the two children are at the Department of Health and Welfare or at the Rexburg Police Department. So with that, bail will be set at $1 million. If bail is posted, there will also be the following conditions that are ordered. Number one, there will need to be a waiver of extradition signed from any and all jurisdictions to be brought back here before the court. Number two, uh, I'm going to require that Ms. Daybell not leave Bonneville, Jefferson, Madison, and Fremont counties. Uh, if she were to leave any of those counties uh, while this case is pending without permission or authorization from the court, that would be a violation of the terms of bond and release. Uh, I'm also going to order that there be an ankle monitor that is placed on the defendant uh, that will need to be all lined out before she's eligible to bail out. Uh, it will be monitoring 24 hours a day, seven days a week as to where uh, the defendant is. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to order as a term of any release or bail that the defendant appear for all court appearances, that she maintain contact with her counsel, um, and that she abide by all the laws of this state, this country, this county, and this city. Mr. Wood, do you have any uh, questions about my ruling regarding the reduction of that bail? No, Your Honor. Ms. Elcox. Just briefly, Your Honor, does the court have a specific form for the waiver of extradition you would like us to use? Uh, I think the jail has one. Does the jail have a form that they have? If you'll communicate with the, uh, the jail, I think they do have a form. If not, why don't you submit the one after you've gotten approval from Mr. Wood? Um, uh, you can submit that after she signed it and the court will review to make sure it meets my satisfaction. Yes, Your Honor. And do you have, uh, would you like us to coordinate setting up the ankle monitor through the jail or do you have a specific agency you would like us to use? 
you can coordinate with the jail and or the sheriff's office. Um, they'll know that information. They may have someone that they usually use. I'm not sure of that. Um, if you have a preference, you could provide that information to them. And if there's an issue, you, it can be brought before me for thank my you. approval. Any other questions? No, thank you. All right. I believe that takes care of everything uh, that we're here for today. Um, in a moment, I'm going to leave. Um, when I do that, uh, the audience is going to be asked to rise. I'm going to leave the courtroom. After I leave, I'm instructing everybody to be seated again. Uh, there will be the removal of the defendant from the courtroom, and then everybody will be excused row by row pursuant to court personnel here today. With that, we'll be in recess. All rise. Now on June 9th, 2020, local law enforcement and the FBI serve a search warrant on Chad's property in Salem. Two sets of human remains are found buried in the backyard. Chad is taken into custody for questioning and later arrested on two felony counts involving the of concealment of human remains while that search warrant is ongoing on his property when they're searching his property mr daybell is also talking to Lori Vello on the phone Lori Vello calls from prison and Chet is telling her that they are searching the property. And this phone call has been kind of very careful. The words are carefully chosen. You can hear how careful they choose their words. Okay? Because in a second, they will find the bodies of JJ and Tylee in the backyard. Mr. Mr. Daybell, after hanging up, is sitting in his car, ready to flee the scene. But later, he's saying that he was not fleeing. He was not. He was not trying to flee the scene, but he was trying to drive to his lawyer. Yes, of course. Anyways, he was arrested that day. From that moment onwards, right from June last year, June 9, 2020, up till now, a lot has happened to. Chet had his pre preliminary hearing. He pleaded not guilty. Lori has refused. Re Lori has um, waived her preliminary hearing and her case moves to district court where she will have a jury trial. But um, what happened on the 24th of May 2021 is that both of them has been have been charged with the first degree murder of JJ Fallow, um, Tylee Ryan, Tammy Daybell, but also for the murder of Charles Fallow. So um, and beside that also for fraud because Chet received that four hundred thirty thousand dollars, but um, Lori Fellow has also been charged with, with fraud because she has still re she still she still was receiving the benefits for JJ uh, Fellow for his care. Now they're both in jail. They're, they're still in jail. Prosecutors in Eastern Idaho announced grand jury indictments related to the deaths of JJ Fallow and Tylee Ryan. But it didn't stop there, as Daybell was also indicted for the murder of Tammy Daybell, his late wife who died in October of 2019. Our Tristan Lewis got his hands on the court documents detailing what charges the pair face. Tristan, what can you tell us and what's next? Kim, warrants were issued for both Daybell and Vallow today on these new charges. And prosecutors acknowledge that progress on this case has been slow, but that's because of COVID safety restrictions within the court. They have just been recently given permission to present this new information to the grand jury. 
Nearly a year after the bodies of Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow were found on Chad Daybell's eastern Idaho property, he and Lori Vallow are being formally charged in the children's deaths. That despite the delays, we have been working diligently to pursue justice for the victims in this case, to ensure we have the evidence required to prove the facts beyond a reasonable doubt in a court of law. A Fremont County grand jury indicted the couple on two charges of first degree murder and conspiracy to commit first degree murder. And another first in this case, with Daybell charged with first degree murder of his late wife, Tammy Daybell. The first time anyone has faced charges linked to her death. Members of the grand jury deliberated and determined there is probable cause to believe the Daybells willfully and knowingly conspired to commit several crimes that led to the death of three innocent people. The couple also has been charged with grand theft by deception, grand theft, and insurance fraud. Court documents show Vallow failed to contact the Social Security Administration about Tylee and JJ's deaths. Prosecutors say she continued to collect Social Security survivor benefits for the children months after they died. Documents also state that Chad and Tammy Daybell signed an application to increase her life insurance policy to the maximum amount in September 2019, just a month before her death. We believe the crimes occurred on or about October 26th of 2018 to January 15th of 2020. Alex Cox, Lori's late brother, also is named the conspiracy charges in the deaths of the children and Tammy. Court documents say that Cox attempted to shoot Tammy in October of 2019. Even with all these new charges, prosecutors say their work isn't done. This investigation is far from over. Well, Lori Fellow has been declared incompetent. She has been declared incompetent, but it's not good. What happens is there is a difference between being incompetent and, in, and insane. <laughs> okay, she has not been declared insane yet. Okay, so she cannot even. So what happens is now with this, with this incompetency is that she's just delaying the trial. She's delaying court proceedings. She's delaying to appear for judges, whatever. She's just unfit to um, to be in court. Okay, well, anyways, is she playing? Okay, well, she has been, well, uh, it's not like, you know, her lawyer points out a psychologist, a psychiatrist and say, listen, can you just uh, make her look like she's unfit to go to trial or to appear in court? Well, what I want to say is actually be, she, she, she is incompetent now, all right? She's unfit. But what I wanted to say is I want to try to make a point. Point is, has she hit rock bottom now? Because a narcissist eventually will hit rock bottom in life. And this whole situation is her rock bottom period moment. Just like an alcoholic hits rock bottom in their life. And then they're like, oh, I have to change. Okay, compare your, you know, an alcoholic and a, and a narcissist are the same. They're both addicts. The difference is an alcoholic has feelings if they are, well, a narcissist can also become an alcoholic because they can also have an alcoholic, alcohol addiction, you know. But I mean, like a normal person who is not a narcissist and is an alcoholic, they have empathy, they have feelings. A narcissist doesn't have feelings. But this is a true case of someone who is a narcissist, a super narcissist. She creates destruction, chaos, panic. She is absolutely irresponsible. She is absolutely jealous, envious. She feels entitled. She is using the Bible in her left hand and the knife in her right hand. She is serving the devil. She is using the Bible as her, as her personal marketing machine. I've said this before also in my previous podcast as well. But this is a typical type of super narcissist and what they're capable of. And this is what the narcissist is capable of, people. Yep, absolutely. This is what a narcissist can do. And it is very, very unfortunate and dramatic that two children, innocent children, an innocent ex-husband or an innocent ex an innocent husband had to die and an innocent wife had to die. Now let's summarize a bit of what um, why she is a super narcissist and I will tell you why she is a super narcissist. Um, I'm going to use one of the most important um, behaviors she has shown in this whole period this whole case right now as you know a narcissist they have an 
exaggerated sense of self-importance. And she felt very important because she said that she's part of the 144,000 preparing the world for the second coming of Christ. So that, that's how important she felt. She also has a sense of entitlement and require constant excessive admiration. Well, she done that as well during the period where she was with Chad Daybell and with her podcast. She felt entitled to the life insurance of Charles Fellow and the benefits uh, she received for JJ Fellow. Okay, she felt so entitled that she could even use the credit card and the Amazon and uh, and the Amazon Amazon account of her dead husband, murdered husband because she knew she was he was murdered and ordered a wedding ring on Amazon. She was also very preoccupied with fantasies about success, power, brilliance, beauty or the perfect mate. You can also see that you 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 have also seen that she believes that she is superior and can only associate with equally special people like Chad Daybell. She monopolizes conversations and belittle or look down on people they perceive as inferior. She expects special favors and unquestioning compliance with their expectations. Now, one example is when she asked Mil Melanie Gibb to make a picture, to take a picture of strangers so she could prove that the children are still alive and she felt that she could ask for that favor from Melanie Gibb and she took advantage of others to get what she wanted and that's what she did all the way you know Lori Fellow has an inability or unwillingness to recognize the needs and feelings of others her murdered children her ex-husband murdered by her brother Tammy Daybell, all examples of that she is uh, that she doesn't recognize other people's feelings or the feelings of um, Larry and Kay Woodcock, what it what it must feel for them to lose their grandchild. She didn't care. She doesn't care that Colby Ryan loses his sister Tylee. She doesn't care. She doesn't recognize the feelings of others. And she's always been envious of others. She was envious of Tammy Daybell. And she believed that Tammy Daybell was envious of her. We could, you could also see her and you see, you see how, how very arrogant she is. Yeah. Or a haughty manner, uh, coming across as conceited, boastful and pretentious. You could see that in her. And she insists on having the best of everything and in this case life insurance and and the narcissist you know also that a narcissist at the same time you know people with narcissistic personality disorder have trouble handling anything they perceive as criticism and they can they can like become impatient or angry when they don't receive special treatment well you you sh you, you saw that in charles fellow she became very angry at him. She wanted to kill him. She threatened to kill him. She called him a zombie. She called him Nick Schneider or whatever. She also has a significant interpersonal problem and easily feels slighted. Yeah, we don't, we, we didn't, we don't, we haven't seen everything what happened behind closed doors, but you know, with Melanie Gibb, for example, her friend. And during that conversation she had with Melanie Gibb, when Melanie Gibb confronted her, why, when Melanie Gibb asked Laurie why she wanted to lie, why she wanted, why, why she wanted Laurie to have her lie, she belittles her and she says, like, this is not you. Well, this is not you. No, of course, this is not you. This is Melanie Gibb. This is not, you know, this is not the Melanie Gibb I want you to be, you know, by gaslighting, you know. And she, you can see her, you know, behaving very passive aggressive a lot all the time. That is what a covert narcissist love to, loves to do. She has difficulty regulating her emotions and her behavior. You can see that she, while she's in jail and she has been declared incompetent, unfit for trial or for to appear in any court uh, hearing or appearance, whatever. But you can see that, you know, the covert narcissist experience, they have... A, 
experience major problems, you know, dealing with stress. And this is a, a big stress for her, this whole case. She's in jail. She is there for her first. She is there for first degree murder. And she is still in jail. Anyway, she will not get out. Just assume that she won't get out of jail. Thank God she won't. And this is what I wanted to talk to you about. Because this is what a narcissist is truly capable of, people. If you are not aware of con or conscious of of narcissistic abuse, narcissistic behavior, narcissistic personality disorder. This is what you get. This is what a narcissist is capable of. Now, I will be following this case because I followed this case from the beginning. Uh, also like a true crime junkie. I, you know, the Chris Watts case, the Chris Watts case is also a very bizarre case. I've ever, uh, one of the most bizarre cases I've ever seen where he kills his two children, Bella and Celeste, his pregnant wife, Shanann, to be with uh, his Jezebel mistress. And, uh, you know, another case, Stephanie Lazarus, who has who is in jail now for killing um, the wife of her ex-boyfriend. She's still in jail. It's also a crazy case. Anyways, I follow this case. I will regularly update on this case as well, because I think this is a very, very bizarre case with a super narcissist a super jezebel narcissist this is a truly a, this is truly a super jezebel narcissist so it, it is quite a long episode and i will go into certain parts more deeper in other episodes you know but at least i wanted to give you an example of what a super narcissist is capable of i hope that it was an interesting subject for today if it was please subscribe to my channel the narcissist guide on youtube thank you so very much for subscribing to my channel and thank you so very very much for my first 1000 subscribers on my channel i truly truly appreciate it thank you so very much leave your comments in the comment box share your experiences with each other thank you so very much for listening today and see you next time